Well, first of all, thank you so much for welcoming me, and thank you for that fantastic introduction. I can't possibly live up to that, I don't think. Um, yeah, being here after a period of lockdown, flying from leaving behind my teenagers and flying from London to New York to speak at such a pre prestigious event, feels like the most glamorous IRL thing ever. And uh, I've got a dress on, I'm not wearing pajamas. It all feels amazing. So thank you. Um, and I'm also terribly honored to be the warm-up act for such an esteemed list of speakers. I think this is going to be a, an absolutely fantastic couple of days. I hope you really enjoy it. So today I'm going to share with you a little bit about how we approach design, type and image at Faber, or at the very least provide some early morning design caffeine to kickstart your day. So I've been designing books and commissioning typography for over 25 years, but my time at Faber this past 50, 17 years actually has probably been the most stimulating of my career. For those who are not familiar with Faber & Faber, it's one of the few truly independent publishing houses in the UK, with no less than 12 Nobel laureates to its name. Now, the list is incredibly diverse for such a moderate-sized house, spanning uh, non-fiction, poetry, comedy and music, fiction and children's too, including publishing juggernaut Sally Rooney, whose cover for Beautiful World, Where Are You?, employing Ronda Regular has been used worldwide. Now, we're a relatively small team. There are just five of us in the department, and we're all absolutely passionate about what we do. So this represents a year's work for us, um, designing and art directing around sort of 360 covers a year with the help of a few contributors. It's very, very pressured, it's as pressured as it looks. But this fast turnaround means that we're never overly precious with an idea, and it kind of keeps us fresh. We like to stay fresh and engaged keep the design concepts coming. Now, this is just a fun slide, really. Um, but although we're nimble, we're kind of old school, too. Um, when we're presenting covers for approval, this is how the magic happens, or at least how it happened before the pandemic drove us into the 21st century. Um, I've been at Faber for 17 years, and this old piece of board on an easel was there before me. And when I started the company, I suggested, well, maybe we should update it, you know? And uh, people were so horrified at the idea that I quickly grew to love its tatty charms, because I kind of had to. And it's a fantastic device. It fits five cover options perfectly, which is really useful for editing ideas. So when I start with 10 or 12, I kind of bring them down to the, to the width of the board. And the sales director always chooses the cover second from the left, and I use this to my advantage <laughs> to get my favorite. I really, really hope she's not watching this. <laughs> So this is an example of a front list title, i.e. the stuff we do every day, and the design challenges it, it presents. So packaging books to a specific brief for authors who write across a variety of literary genres, Akwoke Mizi is a writer, activist, musician, fashionista. They were on the cover of Time magazine as a future leader at the same time as gracing the pages of Vogue. Now, we'd long since established a, ty a type-led look for Akwake as a writer with high literary standing, but then in true Akwake style, they decided to write a romance novel, one with the filthiest first chapters I've ever read. And we had the delicious task of redefining how the fast-growing genre of black romance might look in a literary setting. So taking the sales lead brief to make it a big summer read featuring a Caribbean sunset, the wonderful Anna Morrison, who's part of my extended team, featured a different scene from the book in each nail as nail art. And I think this works brilliantly with the font collector type. So that's the front list, the day-to-day. -day. The thing that makes my role and Faber very special is that it's a heritage brand with a rich design history to match its literary prowess. And a couple of years ago, Faber celebrated its 90th year of independence. And much of our plan publishing plan that year was about celebrating the extraordinary stable of writers we'd built over the years. But at the, heart was a of the, at the heart was a collection of 30 short stories, printing as individual small format books by key Faber authors, past and present. Now, we're usually briefed about a year before publication, but this turned out to be an editorially messy project. Uh, not blaming anyone, and uh, managing the publishing rights of 30 authors living and dead turned out to be surprisingly complex and time-consuming, which led to those words every art director dreads. Could the design department create something good, fast and cheap? Now, 
We were tasked to create a strong series design, something collectible that would stand up from the shelf, a hard-working typographic template that would keep design and print costs to a minimum. Easy. We had a month to turn it around. Now, myself and ex-Faber designer Luke Bird began the journey, starting with a simple marriage of grotesque bold extended and a bright color. But this approach was too samey across a large series and being heavily reliant on contrasting colors, perhaps a little academic too. Then we moved on to more muted tones, getting sort of feedback all the time. Simple, clear type lockup with a changing layout for visual interest. But we felt it lacked warmth and felt a little form over function, again, sort of times 30. Now, actually, this option almost went through a design that used extracts of copy to decorate the cover with a plan to sort of deboss. They were all kind of um, sort of on uncoated paper. So, you know, we, we kind of had a little bit of flexibility with finishes. But not quite right. And so it went on. These were seen as too modern, feeling a little like school books, not distinct enough, too white, they'll get lost. These were some of the comments. Suddenly we were in that place where we were flinging fonts at a wall to see what would stick. Time was ticking on, and we were still no closer to an achievable design system that felt celebratory enough for our 90th year. So then came my light bulb moment. This is a photo of my fridge. I'm not one for a quote card, but I think I might possibly have a crush on legendary tennis player and activist Arthur Ashe, as this card's been on my fridge at home for absolutely forever. And those words, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can, are really good words to live by in design and in life, I think. And with this now very late project keeping me awake at night, that line, use what you have, resonated with me, with me like never before. I have had the privilege of leading an incredible team of talented designers over a number of years and a big book of excellent design and illustration contacts. Rather than have one or two people create 30 typographic covers that fit into a system, maybe 30 people could be given free reign. What was really the worst that could happen? So I completely rewrote the brief. I want to use this opportunity to celebrate not only the publishing, but a rich history of Faber design, where we started, where we are now, but it had to be fast. Now, I often approach series design briefs as if I'm describing it to the design press. I find that quite useful. Thinking about what was, what's going to make it different, what's going to pull it together. And so I set about creating a set of rules and sort of a wish list, to be honest, given the time constraints. So it would be that every Faber designer, past and present, would be invited to take on a brief. And in addition, non-book designers, typographers, illustrators that we'd long to work with from all over the world. I wanted to feel properly global. And the brief was to simply to read the story and do the opposite of your first thought. We really wanted people to surprise themselves, and I really wanted to be surprised. But I would need a typographic design system that would hold everything together. And this sent me into the Faber archives for inspiration, where it all began. So this is Bertolt Wolpe, and he was Faber's art director from 1940 to the early 70s. And here he is outside the offices in Bloomsbury, where we're still based. Um, apparently, he, he always designed with a pipe sticking out of his mouth just like this. This kind of looks like a made-up photo, but this is actually what he looked at, like. And on his team was this woman, Shirley Tucker, who was then described as his assistant, but very much a notable talent in her own right, and responsible for this beautiful classic cover of the bell jar. So, Volpe joined Faber at a time of post-war austerity. Now, it's <clears throat> an understatement to say that he was prolific, designing over 1,500 book covers in his time at the company. And this is a very small selection of his work here. Previously, many of the covers had been illustrated by notables such as Whistler and Nash, but it was somewhat inevitable that this notable German calligrapher, typographer, book designer, and illustrator would take this opportunity to create a typographic system that employed hand-drawn type and blocks of color to respond to issues with sort of the supply chain. Now, before joining Faber, he created several new typefaces, including Albertus, as you can see here, for the, which he created for the Monotype Corporation. And this is still used on many London street signs today. Now, this photo I've taken from the archive shows an early mechanical. 
which is just a sort of a pasted together base artwork that the printer would work from in order to achieve the final cover sort of shown here. I've always been inspired, fascinated by the dexterity of the horizontal and vertical graphic blocks Wolpe employed, trying to carefully deconstruct the commonalities. I particularly love what I call Wolpe's ribbons, cut off little blocks of color that divide and give hierarchy to the space and doing a brilliant job of sort of guiding the viewer's eye around the jacket. And so I couldn't help but resist, but use this as the basis for the 90th logo that year. Now, at this time, we just completed a collaboration with type designer Toshi Omagari and Monotype to digitize Volpe's fonts. And it was beautiful timing. We had five iconic Faber typefaces av available to test and use. We needed something that nodded to our design history, but felt contemporary too. And we loved the way the serif and semi-serif of Pegasus and Albertus worked together, sort of against the odds. They kind of shouldn't work together, but they do. I also needed a restricted palette. 30 creatives all working in different styles. Something other than the grid had to hold them together. There'd be no time for color consideration. Three Pantones would need no color checking. It would be reliable and cost effective. And finally, the grid system. I briefed our wonderfully talented typographer in my team, Johnny Pelham, to create this, a three-fold flap design. This small area needed to hold actually quite a lot of text. The jacket copy, it needed to take the, the Faber 90th flash. I employed um, Volpe's kind of ribbon sort of design here on the sort of back jacket. Branding, title and author, and a list of all the other books. So the elements agreed, we assigned each designer and illustrator a short story to read, the color palette, template. We asked for three to five concepts on a two week turnaround. There'd be no time for kind of really revisions or a next stage of roughs. Despite the tiny budget and tight deadline, everyone we asked said yes. And then we sat back and held our breath. So this was the end result, which was I felt as just a stunning variety of high quality work beyond really what I'd hoped for. I thought it was extraordinary that kind of giving the same brief to so many different you know, sort of creatives could give us something kind of so kind of varietal and sort of different. Everyone gave us their best work. It really was collaboration of the highest order. And although some were predictable in the best possible way, like this from Bill Bragg, giving us, as he always does, at least three brilliant design uh, illustration concepts that were hard to choose from and all just spot, spot on. But it was the typographic responses that felt most satisfying to me. The inner room took a few revisers before it was truly legible, but I loved that the grid allowed for all these very, very different approaches to work. And you can see the sort of first jacket here by Adrian Tomine, who's a brilliant graphic novelist. He illustrated his own cover. And, and he, kind of in common with some others in this set, sort of created these amazing jackets that sort of pushed against and worked with and reacted to the static kind of four corner grid we'd created. It achieved everything I wanted, really. And it truly did feel like a celebration of what Faber Design do best. And this tradition of type and image, this celebration of typographic integrity, is what continues to define the output of the department today. Taking Volpe's tradition of craft and turning it into something altogether new and contemporary for a whole new generation of authors, as we have here with Max Porter. And we often find that it's the simplest of designs that spark ideas for risk-taking marketing assets, like this billboard made with real feathers created to promote the book. And we've taken what Volpe's response to austerity and created a typographic language, language that is about simplicity and economy, knowing when to push it and no one to hold back as, as we have with our most recent Nobel laureate, Kazuo Ishiguro, and his most recent book, Clara and the Sun, and its quiet affecting use of Trajana San's semi-bold. Fully explo exploiting the development of themes in type and color to end up with something that is economic, striking, and thought-provoking, and hopefully best-selling and stop-dead beautiful too. Thank you.